Hello everyone, welcome to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce and today we're going to be spotlighting another horror author. Today I have with us, she's not only a author, but she's also a poet. I have with us today Pamela K. Kenny, and she has a new dark fantasy YA out right now that's called Demon Memory. Pamela, welcome to the Horror Room. Sure. Hi. Well, thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure of mine. So tell us a little bit about Demon Memory. Well, Demon Memories, it's a dark fantasy. It's going to be coming out by Dreampunk Press, which is a really good small press here in Virginia. It's actually been 10 years in Virginia. Uh, it will have a girl that has, in the first chapter, she kind of suddenly wakes herself up in this, she's been sleepwalking. And she finds herself at this burnout house. And she recognizes the house kind of in her memories from something uh, that hits her, that this was a fire there and that she was connected to it and all that stuff. And when uh, uh, she starts having memories, flashbacks to seeing her friends and her trying to start a calling of a demon, dumb things like that. And it causes a fire and, it's a, and she gets out of it. And as she suddenly wakes up and thinks, wait a minute, what happened to the demon? Because it did come. Mm -hmm. And she finds out she's possessed by the demon. Oh. So is there a challenge from, like, writing a normal, let's say, an adult scary story to trying to write a YA? I don't think so. But uh, the only thing for me was hard was... I kept thinking, this is somebody under 18. That, there's adults who will read this. I know that for a fact. I read YA. I mean, even now, there's a lot of good YA out there of all types. It's just that being a mother who's of my son and going through that all his life, I figure, I'm not going to do the cussing. And this is a demon. Mostly, if I do demons in any of my other stories, adult-wise, they're going to be the really downright nasty. And she can be downright nasty, but she's not quite like that so it's enough that it, she's like a teenage girl herself so i'm kind of sit like that where she doesn't cuss and all that but she's sarcastic and and the the really hard part was figuring how i can have both of them because at one point the girl the demon comes on <laughs> and and you want it to speak in its way compared to her and then I figured out, because um, another author who's from Virginia that wrote a lot of good books, who had a werewolf series. And she had put the guy, it's kind of more romance, but the guy and her, the guy who was the werewolf, would switch chapters and hers. And she's like a best-selling author. Uh, Maggie St Stavater, something like that. And I'm pronouncing her last name right. And so I thought, well, that's an idea. They can switch over. So when the demon comes on, that makes it her voice over the girl's voice. Two different animals, literally. So back and forth. That's a yeah, nice yeah. little concept. Now, how long did it take you to from from the time to come up with the idea for the story to actually get it down on paper? Um, so the first time I did it, one of the fifty thousand, and I got some of it down, and then a year later I decided to go ahead and finish it, and it's like close to 90 91,000 words at the time so i did do it 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 didn't take that long once i started going you just have to and then i went back to editing and all that stuff like that so i was surprised i got that much in but i have another novel that's right now on the table i'm look work reworking over that's about 80 something thousand that's a whole adult horror one so i like to try and i mean try and pitch to agents and stuff you know trying to go the next route if I can, and uh, so that one's a, an adult one, but it, it just comes out of me once it does, and I know Stephen King's, I found out he's seat of the pants, and I'm kind of that. The mm -hmm. only difference in me and probably a true seat of the pants or even a person that does write it down, I, I have never wrote things down even in school. I get straight A's in English because I found out if I could go home and write the thing first and they want an outline, I did it afterwards. I to me, the outline just didn't work because things would change in my head. So I wanted to get out of my head first. And I can do that. The only thing with a novel or a novella is I'll have the last. I know what the ending is. 
I do the ending first, it hits me. So I got a, a thing to hit for. And when I start doing it, it's like a colored picture in my head. I can't explain it. I actually see like a color movie over time. So I start writing it. And when it gets toward, I write all the names down, put that in a separate thing. So I know people's names, how it should be spelled. Because the demon's in here. This, her name is actually a real demon's name at one point. So things I put in there, I want to keep that I it's off the wall for me to can't remember or color vise and stuff. And then uh, once I get to the end, I have the last three chapters already. I start writing down a little outline of how I'm going to end it. And then I write it through. And, of course, the ending sometimes does change. And it did with this, and it does with the one I had done, the horror novel, the big one. So it just depends how it goes. That's why I said I see it's a movie, and I let it flow out of me. So That's interesting. That's, that you, that's you, you how start, I write. Yeah, and that's pretty interesting because I, I hear some authors, well, most authors start from the beginning and work their way to the end. But, but there are some authors like yourself that, you know, they have an ending already in mind and they kind of work backwards a little bit. Well, that helps you work to a point to, to a, go to a found a place you want to get to, mm -hmm. of, you know, trying to see, you know, so. But it, yeah. it, it, it's like a movie. It comes out of me in my head every time anything I write. So when it hits. Now, when it comes down to the ending, how many times with this particular um, story. How many times did you change the ending? Really, not that much. Not Adam that I much. Just maybe added more than I wanted something, because it's a YA, and I thought, oh, the romance. Because I wrote romance in my past. I wrote paranormal romance, and, and some of it can be violent too. I won't go into the, my past with that. But um, I, I wrote it a little romance at the end between the the guy and the girl. To make everybody happy and and stuff like that, and of course the little demon who's now <laughs> I'm not going to go in because that'll ruin the whole book. <laughs> and if I tell you what happened, <laughs> but it, it, yeah, it it really didn't change that much. So, and uh, actually, neither has the horror novel that I have either. So, at the end, I kind of had an ending for that too. So it just made it a focal point to get to, and if it changes, it changes, but. It generally doesn't change much so far, if I've noticed with me. So now, who's that? Who's that individual? Once you finish, that you have them take a look at it first. Uh, who had taken a look look at it? Yes. Mm -hmm. who, who's the first person that, like, once you finish a piece of a work or even a piece of poetry that? Well, I had a beta read look at first. it, and she oh, liked really? it. She wants a sequel, so. She already said this. Oh, no, that was the other thing. I'm sorry. No, the, who had looked at it? Well, I had critique groups before. So the last first few chapters weren't through a critique group, which was, it's a very good one here in Richmond. I haven't been to them in a while, but I still communicate back and when he sends the emails when they have their things coming up. Um, so their advice, the ones that do it, like, like the head of it, Joe Earhart, I listen to. He's been pretty good on the money on a lot of things I wrote. So I listen to him. And and then I have friends that will read some of it over, too. So uh, but me in the end, it was it took me three or four times when I edit. So that's how I do it. I go over it again to see if there's something else that I could have changed or did differently. So it it it, it got pretty good by the end. So but I had so the, the one that's really going to see it will be the editor uh, of the publisher okay. when she starts on it. Now, I do have a, a lot of young writers or first time writers. How important is it as a writer to have critique groups or groups or someone to look over your project through the process? You, you should. <laughs> I just read a book that I bought on Kindle. I love werewolves. OK, so mm -hmm. I bought werewolves. And some of them are, uh, but at least they're not bad. They're well, at least written. Hmm. This one was the first one I said, oh, I guess I can't start. I can't finish this. And I'm not, the number one, the POVs, two different POVs in the same paragraph. They're switching over mysteriously. Uh, he's done that a lot. There were storylines that went out of sync. His history on one of them, if this is set in Pennsylvania in 1700s, the guy would not be a name of uh, 
of, of, of aristocrat from England's first name and all that. And they wouldn't him and another guy that are angry would not lead the army together to fight. This is 1739, which is the only thing people might be upset with is is another Englishman and all that. But they were fighting because they were angry about their ter- their territory in a place. And I'm thinking this isn't the English rule or the rule, you know, thing. Of so his history, yeah. So at the end, I went to the end, thought, we'll see what the ending's like. And yeah, he threw the book. And I wrote a review. It's the first one I, I, I when I do write something that I, I wrote on it and I wrote on it on Amazon too. Please, please get an editor. I can see where the things are. You really have, and I pointed out what went wrong in the story. So it's like, thank God it was a Kindle price over a, yeah. a paper pack. <laughs> But, you know, uh, yeah, he, he could have used editor. I mean, pay for an editor. If, if you don't know how to do any of that, if you don't know how to edit itself. And there were times in the first, and I don't blame everybody on e-books because there's a lot of good writers. I mean, the first ones that came out wrote some things that were atrocious. Like, they never even edited. it. And, you know, you want somebody to read your story, not get suddenly they can't handle writing the story because something is like suddenly changes in the middle of something and well or or the pov changes because why are you writing that person and you it's we get all last three or four lines have been the other person you know so yeah so yeah yeah they you should get a critique group you probably might go through different ones online or through your local town and, and check through you'll find a good one like the one I, I always advise people now when they want locally here, I give them and I tell the contact Joe and he adds their name to send them part of the email when it comes up because he's they're really good. Uh, and I've never had any issues and there will literally won't be like your best friend reading it either, which is yeah. what you don't want. You know, you want someone to say, OK, this is what's wrong. And if you listen, you'll see the right one. If you will say the same thing and you know you need to fix that part so that's a really good editor or pay for an editor there's a lot of them out there Joel does that for a business too so now i mean he's been a published author and everything else so he knows how to edit he's done even edit a, a novel the editor the uh, author passed away so the wife had the last book he wanted it published so when they got it to the publisher finally a publisher to find for him that was hopefully good uh, Joe went through the edits with them, so uh, he knows all that stuff. So there's people out there, and they aren't expensive, but just have to go through the prices. You you pay what you give for. Just make sure you get a lot of, you know, reviews from other people that used them and stuff, and how well their books probably did well after that on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, whatever the reviews are. I mean, uh, but yeah, they don't don't you know if you don't know anything about English or you didn't do well in English or, and even that. Let's be honest. Even that, yeah, sometimes you need help. That's why yeah, people go through a publisher and, and they go through all those edits. And I agree because I mean I, I have read, so I like to support indie um, authors and like self-published authors. Right. And unfortunately, when you're doing self-publishing, you're not going through an editor or you know, I mean, someone is well. You should be, but someone is not looking at your what's what. And I've read some where it's like a big, long run on sentence. And I'm like, and it just throws me completely out of, you know, right. what I'm reading because I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? But as a, but as a author, when it comes to, you know, someone creaking, critiquing your baby, your work. Is it tough sometimes, or I mean, is is it one of the things that as an author you got to have well, some tough skin? It's it's like I tell people, it's like going to look for a job. You're not going to get picked, by, or they're going to not pick you. So if it, it's like same thing with, well, you're sending your story off. It's a re, you get rejections, you're going to be hurt anyway. Yeah. So it's better to hear it now from really good people that will tell you, at least good beta readers. Same thing. You want beta readers to tell you the things, and she actually went through it. So that's why I said I'd have to go over my novel and look what she got. But she did like it, and she's looking for the re- – and that's not the YA. This is the horror – I keep forgetting – the horror novel itself. And she wants review a second book to the, all those, too. So, 
uh, yeah, you you want people to be honest with you. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I agree. So I mean, and and let's be honest. Uh, when we look at our babies, we we really don't see the forest for the trees with our babies. We we uh, you you can look at somebody else's work and find everything. Dot dot dot. Mm-hmm. But sometimes yours is not as dot dot dot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you exactly. might miss a few things that they don't. And I haven't disagreed with any editor, basically, anyway. So over the years, I had nonfiction and fiction. So they're there to make it better. So that's why I have one self published book. So and it's going to be picked up. I say I'm taking it on the end of this year because I don't like Amazon at this point. And that way she'll put it through Ingrams, but it's uh, my one novel, How the Vortex Changed My Life. So it's kind of urban fantasy with horror, yes. <laughs> I read, a, read it one time, one lady in that reading, I had, oh my gosh, that sounds frightening. Then she buys it anyway, so I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, so, you know, uh, but that's it. It's To me, the self-published part, it's hard to get all that stuff up you have to go through. So I'd rather have an <laughs> editor through that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's the only one. When people say, How, where'd you sell public? Uh, that's the only one. The rest are not my publishers. Because, I mean, I, I'm assuming it's nice to, I mean, to have that big machine behind you that can, you know, start putting your average, put marketing your work, you know, make sure that is correct. Yes, I mean, you can probably save money by self-publishing, but that, but you have to do all that legwork yourself. You would do a lot of like with yourself, and sometimes a lot of them do go out and pay for editors and stuff. They really do through that because there are a lot of them will say that, and they do tell them, tell people that. So and this guy obviously didn't listen to or listen on forums or something. I guess he would have gotten probably a lot of good advice. I mean, you want people to to like your book. Yes. Um, uh, I wrote Werewolves, Dogmen, and Other Shapeshifters, and it didn't take long. It, that's nonfiction, but it's a lot of um, mythology in it, indigenous and all that stuff. I have soup blood in me, so there's even a thing about white buffalo woman and all that stuff in it. And she made it better, I think, because she knew how to do that. She actually edits, believe it or not, she's got two more years of a regular job at the Marine Corps base up in uh, Northern Virginia. She's an editor for them, so... Wow. She knows how to edit. That's her thing. Okay. So uh, she did that, the pictures and all. And it's been in the top 100, of, at least on Amazon, I can tell, you know, other than the royalties I get. They come from all over. But on Amazon, you, they got that thing up there. And it's been in the top 100, either the Kindle or the print book or together at the same time sometimes. So she did a good job for that part to make everybody read. And even that, I had before I had her, I went through three or four times of editing, make sure it was perfect. And it, and I must have been right accurate on the indigenous. It's in the indigenous library I found out. So That's amazing. And let's jump over to you. You are a veteran. By the way, thank you for your service. Thank you for your service. And you're actually doing something with the uh, women's veteran. Um, anthology, horror anthology, or, or horror anthology, which is an so, so tell us a little bit about that. The Haunted Zone is was uh, started by uh, the publisher uh, Tundra uh, Swan Press, and that's Sarah. I'm not going to try and pronounce her last name. I'm sorry, Sarah, if you end up not listening to this <laughs> later. Um, but um, Dearest, I think it sounds Italian. But anyway, she uh, looked it up wondering about veterans, women's veterans. Doing, and she's found two anthologies that were kind of started, but they never completed it or put it out or anything. So there really isn't any horror anthology done by women's veterans horror writers. Um, I can tell her there's probably none science fiction or fantasy either, because like she's right, it's either men have a lot of that in or they're mixed. This time mm-hmm. it's all women. There's even one from Australia in it too. Wow! So you're going to get all over the world, um, and there's a lot of good stories in there, and a lot of good poems, and some of them, a couple of them, weren't sure about writing horror, but they did it. Including my, believe it or not, my publisher, or editor for Dream Punk Press is in it because she's been in the Navy, and that's 
her name, you know, Tara, Tara, Tara Moeller will be in it. So she was, so that's her first horror story. So Nice. It's amazing. I mean, this is, I mean, listen, I love veterans. My whole family's veterans. And, and there's a lot of women veterans, you know, in my family that I care about. So it's, it's something that's absolutely amazing. Now, now, when is this project coming out? It's supposed to be March, I'm pretty sure. I think she said on her Kickstarter, it's been putting out the ebooks book is going to be earlier. I don't know if that meant just for the Kickstarter people to the what's coming out, but definitely March, I think, is the last I heard. And it'll be paperback and in and, and e-books. It's, uh, goes, uh, money will go to the Veterans Foundation for the Women's Veterans Programs. So that's helping them. And you get a lot of good horror from women. And women are good at writing horror. I'm sorry. We live through a lot of all this stuff more than anybody at some time, yeah. I think. And um, it's just going to be a fantastic one. There's even illustrations. that. And right now there is a Kickstarter left open. I don't know how long. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head where it's at. But there is a Kickstarter for uh, the Haunted Zone. And you can still pre-order. There's a special hardcover edition with a different cover. That's coming through that Kickstarter only. And you can pre-order that and get that one. So okay. instead of waiting to get, because what's coming out is paperback. I mean, you can get paperbacks pre-ordered through Kickstarter. You can do the ebook or even the, the little goodies they have, like a zombie, got a zombie pin and all that stuff. But the, the hardcover is gorgeous, the cover and everything. So you can actually, anybody could go on there and pre-order for that. I mean, that's kind of something different. Well, I'm going to have the link down in my subscription for the pre-order for the hardcover as well as the Kickstarter as well. So if you please go down in the description box and click on that link and support the women veterans. I mean, that's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. All right. Now, you're a busy lady, Pamela. Busy lady. Because you're also working with Cemetery Dance. Yeah, I have an uh, anthology. I have a story poem and an anthology coming out next month but up for pre-order um it's a story that actually took quite a few years to finally and i'm glad it did um 2012 it was supposed to be out through uh another publisher the small press they had clothes for reasons but they were a good publisher they really did well and i guess kevin couldn't lucia couldn't find any other one so for years i kind of waited and waited and I said, oh, like, so uh, I had a chance to submit to the Horror Writer Association Poetry Showcase. It was volume seven. So my head of my uh, local chapter for Horror Writer Association at the time, D. Uh, South, said, oh, that's a really good poem. So I submitted and took out the one line because they had a certain amount of lines and it made it into it. And actually, that poem got me in the best of horror volume 13. There was I, now how I found out because obviously Alan Datlow can't tell everybody you know, who's on this. It was the poetry showcase, and there's 50 in that poetry showcase of author uh, poets. I was one of the five that was named. She nice. liked my poem, Dementia. Yeah, and uh, so it's in there, and uh, I found out from somebody else bragging about them being in. And when I looked closely on Instagram, oh my gosh, is that my name? No, you know, like. How did that make you feel? Kind of shocked. <laughs> well, kind of sh shocked. She liked it. I mean, I felt like I was the peon and the other ones like mm -hmm. Bram Stoker nominees and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, it, it made me feel good. And uh, so, uh, yeah. And then this year, Kevin Lucia contacts me through Facebook and says, do you still have that poem, Pamela, that dementia? He says, I want to do that anthology. And he explained he says, I, it, what it is, is he works for Cemetery Dance. He's an editor. And he mm -hmm. kind of figured it out. Why should I look for another publisher? I'm an editor here. So <laughs> it comes to Cemetery Dance. It's, it's been up for pre-order. You can order on um, Cemetery Dance's site for it. Uh, it's $25 for the anthology. It's a wonderful bunch of poetry. More like story poetry. It's very Lovecraftian. Terror at Miskatonic Falls. Miskatonic Falls is, is quote, it's pretty Lovecraftian. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a poor prose in it by him that'll tell this policeman looking what happened to these people that was in this town that disappeared overnight. 
during winter. So uh, it's like the long man cometh. That's all I'm going to say. But it, you can almost read the blurb up at the site. And it also is going to become it's pre-order for Kindle too on Amazon. But he awesome. says it'll be all over once it's out. But right now, you know, that's the two places for pre-ordering getting it. Well, once again, I'm gonna have the links to all of your projects down in the description box. So definitely go down there and click on it. Now, Pamela, how in the hell do you are you able to come up with the all these pop these ideas out of your head so fast? I just let it come out of my head. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I mean, do you like so when it comes to like brainstorming ideas, do you have like a ritual, like you go sit down in a quiet room and drink a glass of wine, or does it just happen when you're in a grocery store, just getting groceries? It can come anywhere out of my head. Um, but if it's a, a, a submission call, um, sometimes I'll look at it and I'll try one. Sometimes one of them, I actually took me three stories because <laughs> I changed it by the third one. So I have two other stories. So, uh, it, it was something I liked better, but most of the times it hits me what I want. Like this one I submitted, just submit it to a call, and I'm not going to say anything because if it doesn't make it, it doesn't make it, whatever, we'll see how it goes. And they had a certain thing they wanted, and suddenly it hit me how to do it. And it's Lovecraftian too, that's all I'm going to say. But it had to be something add to that way. And sometimes it just hits me how something should be done. Uh, so, um, there was one I did a, a flash fiction, and my HOW group was wanted to do a flash fiction critique things, and I had a, quite a few. And said, "Oh my gosh, that's pretty." They didn't, I guess, expect that. I mean, the story when I wrote this one, it's this little Mexican kid. He's living here and being chased by bullies, and he's Hispanic, right? So you know, or whatever. And he's hiding behind this trash can or behind them a mall. And they're going away. They finally leave. And he suddenly gets his voice talking to him. And there's this, tell him about this mushroom, which is on the ground, which, number one, I don't know if I would pick up a marsh ground behind a trash can on the ground, but he tells him to eat it. And originally it had it written for, I think, for food of the God type of thing. So, yeah, the mushroom fit that. And he uh, goes home and ends up uh, upset with his mother, goes into the bathroom. And what happens is he changes. And what he hate, he find when he come out, he, it's an old Aztec god oh. in him, and it wants to bring back the gods <laughs> for the people. <laughs> and so it's when she starts, it says things to her in a foreign language, because I didn't put that in. I didn't know what Aztec, but I could look up Mexicans real easy, and I've heard it growing up. But the other part, he said uh, she's like crying and bowing before him. He says, oh, she makes a great, she would be a great sacrifice. And he tears off her skin and wears it like a cape and goes mm -hmm. off to go out to the world. He said he liked the, because they're, they're both Catholics, right, Mexican? <laughs> and, the, you know, the blood and body of Christ. Well, he likes that idea. He's, he says that they used to do it in the old ways, brought time to bring back the old ways. But that some of those, you know, Christian things are not that bad. Yeah, <laughs> that came out. That's a flash fiction story. So sometimes things like that just hit me. Pop right in the head. Yeah. Now, is there a project or is there a book that you wrote and for some reason you shelved it? And like, you know, it's a it's something you worked hard on before. For some reason, you shelved it and it's sitting on your shelf waiting for the right time. I have quite a few. I have a novel. Uh, I have several novels and they're halfway done. So eventually I go back and I'll read something. I found a story that I thought, well, maybe it wasn't that good. And I started reading and go, you know what? This isn't really bad. I'm shocked. So what was I thinking? So sometimes I'll end up finishing it and, and submit it and stuff like that. Uh, one of them is the one that just made it into a uh, magazine. It's now up. It'll be mailed off. It's up for pre-order. You can order it right now. Issue um, 22. It's a holiday horror one. It's a Krampus story. Okay. How of Krampus, Krampus becomes Krampus. Krampus so, becomes. I, Krampus? I don't think everybody's done that before. <laughs> it's a holiday sacrifice. Nice. And I, I think I'll go ahead and say it. So I don't think it's going to give it away though. If they get the magazine, it's fine. Um, the girls. It's like. It's if you took Krampus' story and add the lottery to it. 
okay. the lottery by Shirley Jackson. Yeah. People get picked. This is the same thing as a lottery. Red and green balls. The one who gets the red ball becomes the sacrifice to Krampus. And that's what the girl thinks. And the father's taking her out there. Sorry, you have to do that. And she's 18. I don't understand. I'm 18. I've been a good girl all my life. I've never did anything to bring Krampus on me. Why, why are you doing this to me? Ends up, she goes in this, pushed into this building. He runs, goes away and leaves her. And this voice comes talking to her and end up there's this Krampus coming toward her. And of course she's freaking out. And then she looks into the eyes and it's her cousin from 10 years before who had been the la that last time they had a sacrifice. And it's every 10 years Krampus has to have a new person become it because they start melting away and the soul they don't know if, like she said i don't know if the soul melts with the body or it goes to heaven or hell i'll find out but it's your turn now so in the end that krampus going to visit with santa or the kids and they, she's got her little brother and twins twin brother and sister down there and the mother goes is that and he says no sh that's krampus that's krampus father says that's an interesting so, story. That's an interesting. So, I mean, nobody's, I don't think, ever said, how does Krampus become Krampus, right? I <laughs> think he's from hell. He's a demon, but. Yeah. Because Krampus didn't get baked into this. I'm trying to think when did Krampus become baked in this country. I'm trying to think. I want to say it was whenever that movie was released, because it was a Krampus movie release. And it was actually earlier than that, because there's one here well, locally to do a walk. I couldn't do it this year to go take pictures. I had another interview that night, Saturday night. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, they do it every year, the, uh, the first Saturday, because that's even if it's not Krampus Day, because that's best for everybody. And they do the, they did the walk a few years before that. So it's probably been out for quite a while. Yeah, it's, it's been in, in in the 2000s. I don't think it was in the 90s. I don't, I don't remember. I'm, in I'm pretty sure in other countries where it's from, yeah, like Germany yeah, and maybe yeah. Poland, places like that. There's but Black Peter. There's all sorts of weird names. I mean, uh, believe me, there's a lot of interesting characters. Because uh, yeah, I'm doing a Krampus thing. I'm doing a video for my show. It's a Krampus thing next weekend. So, yeah, Krampus is, there's, there's something Krampus everywhere. Like, it, it's become, like, even, like, the haunted houses, they're open during Christmas now. Oh, and yeah, they do it here, too. They did Krampus. it the one, what, last weekend here. The one yeah. up, uh, it's called Red Vein. They do it every year, and they do the, the Krampus, but they do other Halloween stuff, too. They even had a nasty little uh, <laughs> gingerbread boy, so I can imagine, yeah. You can do a lot with that. You can do Yule Cat. That's a think about a big cat coming after you. Yes. <laughs> a new pair of socks. The cat's going to get you. I have not done the Krampus haunted thing, and I don't know if you see my channel, but I, I do a lot of walk through through haunted houses as well. And I haven't done a Krampus. Well, I haven't found one that offers a Krampus that will allow me to come in and videotape. So let me. But yeah, that's. But I feel like I'm gonna have to go find one. Those walks. If there's one near you, there's a walk. Like I said, we have ours. We have a walk. That's the first Saturday, and they walk through it, and you can take probably pictures and stuff with them then. I mean, yeah, so they have a lot of people come dressed up in good masks they made themselves. Some just make up and put the horns on, you know. They have the people that want to be whipped. <laughs> they don't touch the, the public because they can't, but, you know, everybody wants to pretend that Lee and I thought they're doing that. But, you know, they're looking for someone who's a bad boy or girl, and we're going to put you in a basket exactly. and take you to hell, so... <laughs> Because, because I, so I live in Maryland, so I'm part of the DMV. Uh, but uh, I've seen some in Virginia, which is not that far from Maryland, of course. And there's some in Pennsylvania, but I haven't seen any in Maryland. So I'm, I'm definitely going to. I was supposed to go to one in New Jersey yeah. a couple weekends ago, but I couldn't get out there. But yeah, but I see that they're all over the place. I haven't seen one in Maryland or in Baltimore or even like the D.C. area or even Northern Virginia. But um, I see that there is in Richmond. So if you know, it's in Richmond. Right. And the night before they have a, and the, during the day they have a, a gallery thing through one of the gallery places, but doing with Krampus stuff and, and Christmas stuff like that. So the dark stuff. Actually, two days before that, uh, my children's book, which is edited by, actually been, uh, the illustrations are done by, they hired a, uh, someone from Richmond here, by the way, and I, I met her and everything. She uh, uh, was doing that when I was doing something else at the time. I always do Ecoff Elementary's Jingle Bell Bazaar every year, and I sell horror and everything else there, so. 
But she had the other thing with the Krampus thing that they did. And she did a, a Thursday night. They had a special one where people could listen. You pay for it. They did a, a panel on, on creatures of Christmas horror. And she mm-hmm. was on that panel. So, uh, nice. uh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. She does a lot of that stuff. That's what they said. You did Christmas fairies? You, you Christmas book? Children's book? You know, because they think of her as vampires and stuff like she makes an art. She does gorgeous art. So, and the fairies look realistic like fairies in mine. So, um, yeah, she, she they did it that, that this year. So, Krampus is getting pretty popular. So. It is. So, I might have to take to take a three-hour drive down to Richmond next year, So, which is not that far it's in it's in Cary Town, so yeah. All right, so Pamela, where can everyone find you? They can find me at my website, which is Pamela K Kinney. That's P A M E L A K K. Remember two Ks, I N N E Y dot com. I'm on Facebook. I have a Facebook uh, author page too, which will say Pamela K Kinney and then slash author, or you can find me in my regular one. Doesn't matter to me. I mean. Um, I'm also on Instagram and kind of on Twitter. I'm not too sure about that anymore with the G, th- whatever it's called X now. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I, I do like Instagram and that, and and that's really fun. And and of course, uh, Facebook. So you can find me on there. But um, I'm on Goodreads too. Okay. Well, listen, Pamela. It's been an absolute blast having you on. Listen, I hope to see you at the Krampus thing in with Richmond. I, I might I see you in Richmond. next year. I, I, I had an interview. I wanted to go so bad one of those nights and take video or something. All those people walking. I think that would be so fun. Oh, I got it in the magazines it. and the paper locally. So I will love it. I'm telling you. And then like, plus I go to Richmond anyway because Richmond has two horror conventions every year. So I always get out there for those. So I'll definitely be in Richmond. But, we have conventions down here. We have RavenCon. I'm a mm-hmm. guest next year at that. That's a good one, of oh, course. And that's uh, in, in Richmond. And we got a lot of good stuff down here. So Richmond is awful. And you guys have the flying squirrels, too. Yeah, I guess. Oh, yeah, I we do. Team. Yep. <laughs> I'm a huge baseball fan, so I've been to a lot of different stadiums throughout the country. So um, They're fun people anyway. So Yes. Yes. All right. So listen, everybody... Go down to the description, support, go ahead and go ahead and pre-order. And as well as donate to the Kickstarter. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. We've got some amazing programs here helping women veterans. Pamela, you're more than welcome to come on anytime. Sure. This, was, this was a fun interview. No problem. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for coming to the Horror Room. I'm Travis Bruce. I'll see you guys next time. Take care.